Thanks. Good evening and welcome to Classic Car Restoration Club live Q&A. Uh, I'm Mark Simpson. I'm joined by Ross Keel and Terry Wright again tonight. Um, we're uh, sorry for the little bit of delay as always, you know, when you got computers and all this technology involved, there's always something that's going to like, you know, yeah. bite you every once in a while. And that's the way we found it tonight. And, and of course, you know, the humidity kicked up just in time for us to close doors and get in the shop here. So, you know, it uh, it's a little little hot and humid in the shop, but, you know, we'll bear with you. We'll wipe our brow on occasion and, yeah. and drink plenty of water, right? Yeah. I got that's it. Right. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for coming up. Now, before we get started, right below the, the chat roll box on the, the site, there's a little offer there for 66 tips. Uh, it's, a, it's a free download. It's something I put together with like 66 car restoration tips. And I think, you know, if you guys can download it for free. Just click on the button, download it. Uh, you get some useful information, even if you can pick up like, you know, four or five things out of there that, you know, to help you out in the shop, you know, it's, it's a, it's a bonus. And, um, like I say, anything that's free is worth saving up for. So hopefully you enjoy it guys. Um, uh, all right, let's get, uh, knowing we're late, we're going to get right into it. Sorry guys again. Uh, Kevin Berg writes, I have a 1950 Ford sedan with original flathead. It always ran hot. I want to cool it off the engine, uh, cool off the engine compartment. I have uh, used exhaust wrap, high flow water pumps, aluminum radiators, electric high flow radiator fans. My question is what works better? Setting up a fan to bring cool air in the engine compartment or to set uh, set up a an exhaust fan to remove the heat from the engine compartment. Hmm. Uh, uh, I have seen that. Well, especially on like 1930s cars, where the engine compartment is really small, and the sides of the uh, of your hood are right up against your block, darn near, and and it's really tight. I have seen people put you know, fans down low to help get the air out of there once it was, in, you know, once it's coming in through the radiator and get better flow. But, I, you know, I, on a car like a 1950 Ford, you know, it's a pretty big car to need something. There's a pretty, that's a pretty yeah. big engine compartment. So I'm thinking what, you know, the, you know, I know guys with flatheads that run the fairground circuit all day long, you know, putting it yeah. five miles an hour, never overheat. But, you know, you, there's a number of things that can, that can do it, you know, even, um, so then I'm, I'm questioning, okay, what, where, where's the culprit here? You know, I've, I've fought some of this stuff on some cars over the years myself. One of the things I know for sure that will improve the efficiency of your radiator and fan is make sure you have a shroud on your on your fan because then then you're not just sucking air around a big donut uh, the, where the fan is pulling the hardest you're you're actually pulling it from the entire radiator core right. um, and only from there right and uh, I don't know you guys. What else have you guys done for to help keep your cars running cool? And depth of the fan in the shroud makes a difference also. Does it? Oh, yeah. If you're mm -hmm. too far into the shroud, you're not going to cool that, that engine. It needs to be probably halfway out of the shroud, the mm -hmm. fan, in order to, because if it's inside the fan, you're going to circulate it inside. You're not going to pull it. But if it's, it has to be about halfway out of the shroud. So that would probably be the thing mm -hmm. to check or if he doesn't have a shroud put one on. But. Yeah. And I, I found that baffling in front of the core support depends on how much room there is. Um, routing it into the radiator and so just pulling off the, off the street down below, that, mm -hmm. you know, have it more coming from the front of the car helps a little bit. So mm -hmm. some baffling to route it into the radiator. Mm -hmm. 
So oh, you mean up? like uh, in front of, like actually in front of the radiator yeah. between the core support and the grill kind exactly. of thing? Maybe exactly. Exactly. Setting up some baffles mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And and I, but I, you know, I keep going back to. I know a lot of guys with flatheads that never run hot, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe maybe there's something else going on. You know, maybe. Uh, there should be plenty of room for the hot air to get out underneath the car and around. Yeah, you know, yeah so. sure. And there's not going to be an issue with water going through the head, even though it's it's just are, while there is water going through the head, there isn't, you know, that, you know, it's not like a uh, like an overhead valve engine. Um, as long as that radiator is getting cooled, it should, it should uh, be fine. So. Yeah, I have already used an exhaust wrap. That would help cut the heat dramatically. High flow water pump. Yeah, I don't know. I've heard both sides of that fence. Some guys will say high flow water pumps work better and some don't. Uh, some will argue that it pushes the water through so fast it doesn't have time to cool. Um, I think the first thing would be to do is make sure it's got a shroud. Yeah, a good, a good aluminum radiator should. You yeah, know, aluminum. Uh, yeah, that should have solved. Well. And he's got electric. He's got electric fans. So he doesn't have a lot of control over how much how deep that fan set into his road. Uh, what worked better? Uh, yeah, it, your big your biggest thing that's going to cool your engine is getting the air coming through your radiator everything you can do to efficiently get it through your radiator and make sure your radiator has you know sufficient capacity for your engine it shouldn't really be an issue I, guess um, I didn't see that he had electric yeah um is the electric pulling or pushing yeah you yeah have... i don't know some of those electric fans you know i know even with my 35 i've got two electric fans on there are they pulling in my car i can run on the hottest day all day long but if one of those fans shuts off, the oh. car gets hot real yeah. fast. And are they so, they're, yeah, both of them are pulling. <laughs> yeah, I think that's... Are they shrouded know, too They should not? be. Uh, they are shrouded. Themselves. Themselves are shrouded. Each are shrouded. Themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Start picking on each other. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I... I uh, you didn't mention anything about shrouding. I, you know, if if you're not even with an electric fan, it's best to shroud it, and you'll notice a huge difference when you do. That'd be my first guess, unless you're, you know, and if Kevin, if you've uh, already got it shrouded, you know, feel free to uh, type in and, yeah. and we'll explore it some more. Tom writes. Tom Payne writes. Uh, sometimes in the future, I <laughs> I hope this year. Uh, I will be painting. Oh, a pink question. Got a right. pink guy. We're going to question the pink guy. I will be painting my 66 D100 at home. I have friends that do this with pretty good success. My question is should I invest in a portable paint booth? What kind, the, the kind that blows up with forced air? I've seen them. I think we've all seen those. They look kind of impressive. Carcoons, yeah, they are pretty cool. Um, you plan to use it more than once? Right. I yeah. probably wouldn't invest in one if you're only going to do it for one. Yeah, if you're only going to do one car, I probably wouldn't invest either. Uh, you can do, well, you recently painted your car in your garage. Tell us what you did in the garage. Yeah, to I make just it. went and bought some heavy mill plastic, clear plastic, and I just built walls and ends and I put filter material in the end and box fans and it worked just fine. Tore it all down and threw it away. I thought about doing the, the carcoons, the little portable ones. I would have loved it. It would have been great. And I actually um, reached out to some customers to see if anybody had one. And I had one that did have one, just got rid of one. Maybe you can find somebody and some, some uh, forums that maybe has one and wants to sell. I mean, it's kind of like a rotisserie, you know, it's nice to have, but what do you do when you're done with it? Yeah, so yeah. And, and, you know, actually, that's the kind of thing that, you know, I know like some of those things, uh, some smaller car clubs kind of, not not the big associations where there's 5,000 guys, but when there's like a dozen guys, I've seen them go into things like sure, ro yeah. buy a rotisserie together yeah. and then any one of them can use it and then, or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that, uh, you know, portable spray booth, you know. If you're a member of a small club, maybe that's an option for you. But, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I've painted lots of cars in garages and, um, and 
I think you can achieve as you know. I've had I've had professional painters uh, come to me and say, "You painted that in a garage," and then just like, mm-hmm. "Yeah, I painted it in a garage," and then you know, half times they won't believe you, and then they, yeah. and then because you know, did you guys wipe the floor? I typically will. Well, it depends. Uh, the only thing I hate about wetting the floor is it brings up the humidity exactly. instantly. I've heard people do but just to, for the dust. What I, I do like to do is I don't like to walk around with, you know, a quarter inch of water in my shop. But I do like the concrete to be moist or damp, so then nothing really sticks to it, and it, it helps keep the dust down where I don't have to worry about splash up. Uh, but that's just my preference of uh, doing it. What Terry? Well, we used to wet the floors down constantly back in the day. Um, before waterborne paints. Um, don't do it with that because exactly what you said, it just puts more humidity in there. Um, it does It does work. The problem I had with it, you better keep your, the first four feet, six feet of your hose off that floor because you're going to drag it, you're going to reach over your hood and yeah. water in it. And the drip will or, come off your hose. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a horse apiece. If you're careful, it does work. If it's if you're if you're that dusty in the first place, I don't know. Maybe I'd, that's just a band aid, really. Yeah. Why is it holding on dust? But in my case, I put plastic on the floor too, and oh, and my yeah. polyed the whole thing, that's and, and I just threw the whole thing away. Yeah. Um, I would say if you got the 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 means to buy one of those, and you have the place to put it once you're done using it, if you want, I mean, I mean, they're kind, they're cool. Yeah. I'd love yeah. to have one. Yeah, I, but I, I don't think there's one of us that would say yeah. any other way. <laughs> but it's yeah. going to take up some space when you're not using it, too. Yeah, um, yeah. Even all all taken down and uh, t- all the air out of it, it's yeah, still going to be. Yeah, it's going to be twice as big as what you got it because it's not going to yeah. go back <laughs> the same. It's like so then you have to store it, or yeah, that's what I mean. Know, you got to put it somewhere, right? or flip it and sell it, or something like that. I suppose you, you could do, but and you and you most likely could. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked into those, um, like those outdoor shelter tents you can buy. At, You're going to buy a bouncy house to make your Not car? a bouncy house. <laughs> um, like a Northern Tool, you get the, it's just aluminum two frames. And oh, yeah, yeah. And you got a yeah, zip on the yeah, end. Yeah. You know, you use for outdoor storage sure, in some yeah. places. I even thought that's even kind of reasonable. But yeah, there's a floor idea. to it, but um, uh, I think I didn't reasonable. do it because it wouldn't fit in my garage. It was just, it was just too tall uh-huh. to fit in my garage. With the doors open, with the doors shut, it would fit. But if I had to close or open the doors, which I wanted, but um, so I just went with the plastic, and it was I just used one by twos and held it up Frank to it the up. walls with that. Yeah, yeah, it worked. It worked great. Having having painted enough cars in garages, I can tell you, do you need to wet floor? You know, no, but you know, you do need to have them really clean, and you do, and I like to at least get everything wet and let it kind of, so it's not wet, but did, you know, the concrete still has moisture in it. So it doesn't, so paint doesn't stick to it so much. I like your idea. Terry I likes like to one. plastic okay. everything off. What I don't like Here's, about, what I don't like about plastic is as you walk around the car, then suddenly you're stuck picking, you know, it starts picking up on your feet. You definitely and do it, that. It, the, and it's like, it's it sticky. Yeah. And um, the, uh, I have done it that way as well. Uh, I have seen pro shops. Uh, there was one pro shop in southern Minnesota. Their entire paint booth was made out of PVC pipes and hoops, mm-hmm. and then they stretched plastic over it. Mm-hmm. Then all the lighting sat outside. It was clear Shine plastic, sure, yeah. and because it was inside of a barn, actually. But all the lighting was outside of the plastic, so they had all the lighting. And if there's that's one, mine was too. and if there's one thing that's really important, if you're if you're painting in a garage and it's get lots of light, uh, I like to have lights down low and off to the side. And you can buy like shop lights for that, you know, like ceiling shop lights for like ten, twelve bucks. And, you know, you just pick up three or four of those and Run them down the side. lay them on the sides and you, you know, then you'll get light under, under your rockers and stuff like that. So you don't get any surprises when you're all done because that's my, one of my pet peeves. Yep. Getting all done and then it's like, oh, I missed a strip on the very bottom yeah. edge. Now the thing about the wetting the floor, they, they do make a uh, dust control spray. You can just put it like a pump 
sprayer, like a garden sprayer. You mm-hmm. can spray your floor down, and it'll, it'll help hold dust down, and it'll track the overspray and stick to it. Yeah. And then you can wash it off too. Cool. When you're done. Another option. Um, I have customers that put indoor outdoor carpet in the booths and they vacuum it. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. It's, it's it's a funny sight to walk into a shop and see the painter vacuum in his booth, but yeah, they have it. They, they do it. And there's a there's a dirt trap, sticky, grippy mat that you can put down that you can just swap out to after. Same thing. Hmm. Yep. Nothing worse than have a paint booth that's got a half inch of paint built up on it and tripping over. Yeah. Yeah. There was a shop here in the western suburbs that where the owner would always piss that there was always dirt in their paint jobs. And then it's like, well, maybe the first thing you had to do is move your blasting area to, you know, <laughs> further than 10 feet away from your paint booth. <laughs> so, you know, some of it is just common sense, yeah. you know, but it's a good time to, if you're going to paint your garage, make sure you clean everything, you know, clean on top of the lights, clean anywhere where any dirt is going to be. If you're going to plastic everything off, that's a, you know, I, I've had real good success doing that. Um, but you're still going to need ventilation at that point. Otherwise, if you're in a big plastic place without ventilation, then it builds up real fast in there. It sure does. Yeah, you want to you want to get it out. No doubt. So you so carcoon or the portable? Uh, yeah, if you have the means to do it, go for it. Cool. All right. Next, JP writes. 79E150, that's a van, isn't it? The approximate, the, the, the brake, it must be a proportion valve, uh, is frozen, I guess, causing the brake warning light to come on. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, this means the back brakes are not working. No. Uh, having trouble finding a new part also. Um, there's yeah on the on the it's the combination valve uh, it has a proportioning valve to the rear brakes it has a metering valve to the front if it has disc and then it also has your brake warning sensor and what that does is if there's a loss of pressure either in the front or the rear lines there's a little slide that moves back and forth and it'll like move to one side or the other and that completes a circuit that sends the brake warning light off on your dash. What happens sometimes if you if you do lose pressure on one of those on one side or the other, that rod shifts and sticks. It doesn't mean that you don't have brakes on the front or the rear. It just means that that switch is stuck. Not centered. Um, Sometimes, sometimes you can open, the, you know, if you lost rear brake, sometimes you can open the bleeder on the front brakes and, you know, hit them hard and it'll kick back the other way. Sometimes just, just mashing your foot against it, if with the whole system broke, uh, you get it, you know, giving it a few quick stops, you know, hitting the brake pedal real hard a few times, sometimes that'll free it up. Uh, in a worst case scenario, we, you know, you got to open up and move it or, you know, replace the proportioning valve. It shouldn't, the proportioning valve, that, that warrant, that brake warning light won't, uh, if that rod shifts front or back will not affect the brake fluid flow to either side. It's only affecting when it senses not even pressure from front and back. Um, so as far as as far as I'm guessing uh, the brake he's guessing it's frozen because the warning lights are on yeah uh, does it mean the back brakes are not working no it doesn't mean that uh, having trouble finding a new part also we have a video on our site on uh, it was Bob Wilson uh, who took a Mustang uh, combination valve and actually rebuilt it and uh, you can check that out uh, you can rebuild those proportioning valves there are re proportioning valve are the the combination valve rebuild kits uh, if you can't find a kit uh, combination valve isn't that expensive um, 
the uh, but it, it's just a matter of getting that rod to reseat in the middle of it. Yeah. Or unplug it. <laughs> unplug the warning light. <laughs> well, you could do that. You could do that too. It's a safety thing. <laughs> yeah, who do you think you are, Ross? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about I you do it. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about Ross's breaks for a while. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Uh, Russell writes, I have a 1934 Ford street rod. That's, that's, a, that's a good one. Uh, with all new brakes and lines, etc. Pedal keeps going to the floor after five bleed outs using manual feet and hand vacuum. Uh, Master and booster are below the floor. Um, what do you think? Oh man, yeah, and it can be a pain to bleed yeah. underneath the floor. Um, I know this because mine's under the floor, so on a couple of my cars in the past, um, it uh, so what's your process for bleeding that? I, I've never had, a, 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 I usually use vacuum. I, I've almost exclusively used a vacuum pump on, on those cars just because they tend to bleed out real easy. Um, but I, I, you know, I can feel his pain, uh, you know, having had car, well, this car here, we bled it probably like 90 times before we finally got the brakes to finally uh, to work right. Um, and then, you know, it was, you know, it, we walked away and, you know, I was like, oh, geez, I don't know where we're going to get this car. And then, you know, we come back the next day and it's like, Hey, great, seemed pretty good. You go, what happened? You know, immaculate self-repair, you know, that's always been one of my favorite ones. The, uh, bleed, bleeding brakes. Here, Ross, you get to share all your uh, b b brake bleeding uh, stories in one. And he said he used a vacuum. <laughs> he did. He did I mean, use a vacuum. That's the only way. What I would suggest. I mean, you got to pull it through. Yeah, it might help. If you had somebody pushing also, but it sounds like he did the same thing yes, at yes, the same time. Both. Yeah. Yeah. There are brake uh, bleeding systems where. Uh, where you actually push fluid from from the bleeder up, um, you know. Alter, and, and I, you know, I keep thinking, well, is that going to work any better or worse than the vacuum method at that point? You know, because fill the line surface. You mean? Well, yeah, you're filling the lines back to the reservoir. Mm -hmm. Seems like it would work because when you're syringe bleeding a master, you kind of you're pushing the, the fluid through the port into into the reservoir. Um, hmm. Yes. Yeah. It. You know. I. There. You know. Another thing I know that our, our good buddy Scott he had a he had a car that he literally had to take because of the way the brake lines went and they kind of looped up and came into his uh, calipers he literally had to take his caliper off and you know kind of just hold it underneath the car with the bleeder up and you know and stuff beneath the pad so they wouldn't right. blow out the piston but just to get the line straight enough so the air would come out of it because otherwise it was doing some Keep weird stuff. Up. And that was the only way he found to bleed them out. You know, some of that just been, you know, that can be in planning and routing uh, your systems, your, your brake lines to begin with and how easy or how not easy they can be. Uh, I'm going to assume if you've got, you know, power brakes and everything else, it's a full street rut. I think you mentioned is, but it, make sure your your lines don't go higher than your calipers or you know your bleeders mm -hmm. because otherwise you're going to trap air in there and it's going to be a nightmare to get it out. I mean, yeah, some of it can be a real challenge, and that's why you know that's why I've heard some guys you know profess that they uh, you know 
bleeding of them or pressure bleeding them backwards is the way to go. But I, I haven't tried it, so I can't. I'm not going to sit here and say do that because I haven't tried it myself yet. Uh, I've never owned a car with brakes below the floor. So. Huh? You should. That's Those cool. are the good ones. <laughs> There's such a thing. <laughs> brakes below the floor. <laughs> What's that? What's that? My 35 below the floor. Mm-hmm. You still have that car? 54 I had was below the floor. <laughs> you still have that car. Oh, yeah, I sure just because. <laughs> the uh, JP, anyone else having an issue having audio problems? Need DTO sign in or become a member? Um, no. I don't know. Uh, this is uh, maybe our, our uh, I'm not aware of having any audio issues tonight. You know, we had plenty of mechanical issues coming in. If uh, 509 probably weren't even on. Oh, you know, yeah, maybe not. Or maybe it was just early. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And from Facebook or from one of our online sources. Hi, everyone. We're, well, no, that was Katie. Michael writes. What's the best way to fix rust under a vinyl roof? Oh, let's talk to the go. vinyl roof rust guy. Oh. Is that it? That's just a question? Yeah. yeah. Best way to fix rust under a vinyl roof. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> what's so easy? <laughs> what's your easy answer? First, first cut, remove cut your off. vinyl roof. <laughs> Take the vinyl off and then repair the rust. Yeah, as you yeah, normally would. I, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, you know, and unfortunately, Very you know, typical. Yeah, uh-huh. and a lot of in Detroit was notorious for not putting enough paint under vinyl top cars. You know, they're known for not putting any. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they they were thinking, uh, hey, we're. Uh, going to put a vinyl top on this there's no need to you know actually paint it all that well but yeah they're they also didn't want them to last 10 20 30 years either yeah they didn't build them to do that but yeah i've seen it where there's no paint underneath the vinyl it's getting a vinyl top Very you, rusty mean, you mm-hmm. strip it off and it's bare metal under you there and yeah. it just yeah. yeah or even on the inside of the when you pull the headliner down and you look up and it's all just bare metal with a nice orange patina on it, and you go, they never put anything on yeah, it. Yeah, right. So, you know, Detroit's into making money, so it costs cost them money to put down more paint. So if they can save, you know, this much paint on, you know, the first 150,000 cards they make, they did. So what, yeah, the, the only way that I'm aware to really fix it right, you know, I've done cars back in the day where you kind of peel it up and you, you know, because they were notorious for well, for rusting out, you know, getting that rust underneath it and the back of the C pillar and around the edges. And you just kind of peel up that vinyl and you, you know, kind of make your repairs and, and then you try to glue it all back down but it always you know it never looked perfect you know if you're able to get that peeled off without tearing it up or damaging it to get it to lay back down without looking like you did that looking like you peeled it up especially if it's a padded top oh padded padded top is impossible because then you get that foam and it ends up all over the place but even on the non-padded top they had cars where it was like You'd roll it up and you just try, try to get it back down, and it would uh, give you nothing but trouble. They tend to get pretty brittle too. It depends on yeah. it. Did it say how old it was? What, uh, what kind of car was? He did not he, say. I found pieces of uh, vinyl underneath uh, my A pillar. Um, there's trim that bolts up to the A pillars that the drip rails attached to. And there was vinyl underneath him, sandwiching between that. When I took him off, and there's a nice strip, it was brittle as can be. It was, hmm. yeah. So it wasn't even working with that. It wouldn't have worked. Very cool. Um, Cameron asks, 
I'm having trouble getting my distributor to sit, to sit probably properly. properly I'm thinking, and my 303 dual four barrel on my on a 56 Plymouth Fury. Um, I have a quarter inch gap. A quarter inch gap. Let's see, Cameron. I'm having trouble getting my distributor to my distributor to sit properly on my 303 uh, dual four barrel carb on my 56 Plymouth Fury. I think I have one of those intakes with dual four barrel right over there. <laughs> I'm gonna probably sound ignorant. And the, like I, I do a lot of times, is there an oil pump drive shaft underneath that? There should be. Yeah, and then uh, it's a, yeah, and it should have a, um, cars it was, it was a Plymouth, so it wasn't a Hemi, but it was, a, you know, the, the Plymouth motor, the 318 or whatever, the, or 303. The distributor has a male blade, right? And, but there's like a, a an intermediate gear that operates the, the, that comes off the cam and that drives the oil pump. But then on the top side, the distributor, I mean, and the distributor just has like that flat blade right. thing on it. If I'm correct on your car, it just has that flat blade like Mopar did in that era. And it just fits down into the top of the uh, the top of there's in so basically your distributor is here and that comes down to a flat almost like a screwdriver like base on it mm -hmm. and then there's a gear with an intermediate shaft that that drops in your block and that actually has the gear runs off the cam and then down that intermediate shaft actually connects up with the oil pump at the very bottom what can happen I'm thinking there's somewhere along the line something's not coming together right. Um, you know, the, it makes sure, of course, that you know when you spin your rotor that it engages. When you're dropping your distributor in, spin your rotor, make sure it engages with the the intermediate shaft properly. It should just kind of drop in, then you shouldn't be able to freely spin that rotor when you're dropping it in. If you can, then it's not engaged yet. Um, and yeah, it, it, uh, something, you know, uh, all, my best advice is that something's not dropping in along the line, whether, whether it be that lower, that intermediate shaft isn't dropping in properly to your oil pump and that's not down far enough or the distributor itself is not dropping in and engaging the the upper uh, intermediate shaft gear. Um, one of those connections would be my bet something isn't in there. And, you know, it's sometimes it's the kind of thing where you almost have to, you know, you hate to move an engine around too much once it's all all assembled while you're trying to get it in and set it and everything. But sometimes if you just go in and you wiggle, you're going to turn your crankshaft back and forth just a little bit. Uh, you know, sometimes you can get things to wiggle enough to move in and drop into place. Uh, so yeah, on, it's, on, a, on that style motor, you're saying that the gear does drop in from top, the gear for the oil pump drops in from the top. The intermediate shaft yeah. drops in from the top. They got like the they got like a big opening right. for the distributor and that whole gear assembly drops down through the hole and into it. It's a, it's a pain to try to get it out back out through that hole, but it can drop in through that hole. But you should, you know, the, it's, it's not getting down into the oil pump. Yeah, so either the oil pump, in which case, if you turn the engine, right. you're going to move that intermediate gear enough to drop that into yeah. place. Maybe and, it pulled out just enough, taking the distributor out, it maybe pulled up and it didn't drop back into place. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it's that intermediate chap that's kind of like down, you know, your intake yeah. up here and that intermediate chap is in there. Yeah, right. And, and because sometimes that doesn't want to drop completely in it. It'll like slide mm -hmm. in yeah. and stop short because it hits the oil pump. But Why usually, not? usually if you turn, you know, you know maybe, maybe that's the ticket, you know, just say, hey, look, mark your, mark your harmonic balancer, turn your engine over twice. Uh, because your crank turns twice for to get you back to zero, and it should drop somewhere. into place somewhere. Yeah. You know, maybe have a buddy hold a flat screwdriver on top of it while you, somebody else turns the uh, turns the crank two full revolutions, so you're back to your top dead center. That way, you know. And then, the, then as that turns, uh, as your cam is turning the gear, it should find the proper place with your oil pump if that's not down far enough. Yeah. Because you can't really check that with it. Well, you can't. Really, it's hard to check with the en with the engine all together because you're looking down a mm -hmm. hole and you know to tell if it's all the way seated down it's, it, down. it's, it's down their way so it's, it's kind of hard to tell so that that's be my approach to it uh lynn asked i purchased a 67 mustang is it white <laughs> Just kidding. i want to work on it and everyone tells me to leave it alone Pat, leave it alone. Oh, no, it's Lynn. Huh. Uh, it will be worth more. Uh, it, leave it alone, and it will be worth more. What should I do? I have an opinion on that. <laughs> you are more than welcome to lead off today. Well, I don't know. I guess it depends on what kind of shape it is. Is it, is it original and not been touched? And it is in good shape? I don't know. Well, to me, I like that's worth something to me. So I kind of leave it the people are telling you to leave it alone, but it depends. It depends what it looks yeah, like. Yeah, I guess it depends on is it a fastback or, you know, is it a you hmm. know, 67 sedan? Is that what they call those? Coop. Coop. The, uh, for me, it, you know, I, I, I don't mind original. If it's all bone stock original and it's presentable and it's not you know you don't have like dents all over or rust or or rot issues you know maybe you know even a little rust i could maybe live with if it's like surface rust and has a nice patina to it you know it's kind of a it kind of depends on the car you know as some people have are are frequent to say you know they're only original once and uh, as soon as you start tearing it apart and redoing it, it's no longer original. It can never be back there again. Uh, you know, there are some car shows where survivor cars, you know, are, have a class of their own where they still sport, you know, 90% of their original paint and they still have all their original interior and everything else. There's some merit to that, you know, a good patina, the original car. Yeah, that's kind of it neat to see it's all yeah and all mm -hmm. what you want yourself to I, mean, I think that's key I mean, just what do we yeah. think that doesn't really matter what do you right. think yeah well, what do you want it's your car so whatever you, i mean i mean if it's all numbers matching are you going to sell you know, it you is is the goal to sell it you know or or do you want to make it the way, the way you want it yeah i don't know you're not going to hurt it by uh you know if it's all numbers matching and you want it to a little performance to it and things like that but it's all up to the the owner i would say yeah and i you know i i uh it, it it's yeah I, I agree with you guys it comes down to owner preference and you know you're not building this car for somebody else who thinks it's or you're not building it for whoever you're, you want to enjoy it so i'd say make it what you want to enjoy you know uh it may you know you know, there's always going to be somebody out there who's going to question the decisions you made on your car, who are going to either <laughs> never done that, no. who are who are either going to you know uh, give you crap for doing it or or praise you, but um, 
ultimately, you know, that's the great thing about cars is it's a form of self-expression and you can, and you can make it your own. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you choose to keep the, the body and interior original, but make some performance modifications. Maybe you, so you have more reliability or something else. I know other guys that, you know, they, they wouldn't dare put a performance modification on their car or they'd even buy, you know, a performance exhaust system that sounds exactly like stock. And, um, are we about done? <laughs> I would like to throw out there. I'd like to throw some things your way, but I'm not going to. I'm not going nice. I would say that if you're going to make some of those modifications, if you if you're taking real original parts off, keep them, that and you can have you can send them with a the car too. Exactly. That's yeah. that's huge. Yep, I totally keep agree. Them. Yep, I agree. And you can be nice to me now. All right. Jeez. <laughs> Okay, Michael asked, uh, in connection to my previous question, I have a 73 Ford Fairline uh, made in Melbourne, Australia, before the proper rust prevention was universal. Uh, let's see, oh, I can't remember which was Michael's question. Now, was that the, that was the vinyl top? Yep. Um, yeah, I, my feet, I have a 73 Ford Fairline made in Melbourne. Huh. Before proper rust prevention was universal, um, yeah, in '73, yeah. rust prevention wasn't a, wasn't high yeah, on anybody's was list. Quality metal wasn't either. <laughs> and and, and uh, you know it, it uh, yeah, it, and that would have been like you know probably the height of the vinyl roof era, is uh, you know you know from about mid '60s to about mid '70s, yeah. maybe '80. You know that was like. Yeah, you know, they had the the eighties where they had just a little Landau. Yeah, yeah, they went to the roof. the yeah. Landau. Roof. Yeah, they didn't want a full vinyl top right. anymore. But I bet you they did paint the whole tops then. On a seventy three, probably not. In I, the 80s. I would. Yeah. Uh, oh, eighties. So pretty much more than half the top. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. probably more with the not 80. do it at that point. And maybe by then they started having the complaints with people rusting out under their vinyl no, they tops. Didn't care. They wanted people to buy a new one. 73 Fairline. I didn't know they made them in Melbourne, but that's that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, oh, he did not plug his light. Who? On the proportioning well. Oh, he did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds think alike. <laughs> <laughs> I did a plug light. Well, that, that's one way to stop it. <laughs> you got to break lines. Electrical tape over the, the, the light, too. Yeah. Oh, oh, the question. Uh, you know, the, the guy right there, the question about audio problems was during the late oh, 30. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're still sorry about that. Yeah. You know, we we'll, do our best. We'll blame Ross. Yeah, we have here late. yeah we have some storms rolling through, but yeah. no, that wasn't the problem. No. We, had, we had we had a cable that uh, you know kind of IT guy connects is, us yeah. to the internet. That was our up. IT guy. Yeah, yeah, our IT guy didn't show up today. Uh, all right, Bobby asked, I have an eighty nine F one fifty five O auto under two hundred thousand miles. When you crank, when it's cranked, have 45 to 55 pounds of oil pressure. As it warms up, it drops to less than five pounds when idling. I'm told that's normal, but I'd like to have your opinion. I have seen, five pounds seems really low. You know, usually I don't get much concern until it drops below 10. So, uh, but you know, every car is different. I don't have a lot of experience with the 5.0 F-150. I know when some engines just when they're hot, when they're idling, that the uh, pressure drops. The only other thing um, I'd say is, is, how long has he owned it? Was it did it just start doing that? You know, yeah. it doesn't really say. He says it's over 200k, but 
Yeah, it could you know. be that the bearings are getting clearanced right. out, and you know, if it, there's close to two hundred thousand miles on it, I'd run a little thicker oil. In yeah, there. you could try thicker oil. Uh, I've done a few things, you know, and and I tried to with uh, uh, like a high volume pump that didn't really give me any advantage to it. Um, Turn the idle up. The what? Turn the idle up. <laughs> Turn the idle up. Yeah, idle if you idle at fifteen hundred RPMs. I always have oil pressure. That was a manual. <laughs> the uh, so yeah, it, it what you're describing doesn't sound out of the norm for an engine that age. Um, Eighty nine. What would that be for a motor? Five oh. Five oh. Five oh. That's that's kind of two hundred thousand miles on a five oh. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he, he's getting up there. He, yeah. you know, I, I don't know what the life expectancy of an 89.50 is, but, uh, you know, for you, you don't worry until you're at, what, 350? <laughs> <laughs> well, come on. None of my cars are that high. But... No. But that's, but when, even that's, Chanel, when you, that's when you worry about them. I mean, when I'm, my Chevelle, probably even, but it's off the front of the motor, so it's just depends on where you're sending it from, also. Oh, you know, where you're drawing your oil closer, pressure yeah, from? Yeah, yeah. I mean, mine's out the front of the motor, and mine sits at 10 pounds at idle. Your Chevelle does? Yeah. And that's like a fully new rebuilt with yeah. new bearings and everything? It's always been that way. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in my 35 sits, you know, it you, when, it's, when it's first started up, it's like 65, and that has a 383 small block in it. And that, um, when you first started up 65 yeah. pounds of pressure and it'll be that until it gets hot. And then when you're, you know, eventually when it's really hot and you're just idling, it will drop as low as 10 PSI. And, uh, and I know that because the gauge is, the gauge is set up to automatically start blinking when it drops below 10 PSI. So it. I know if I, if it, you know, sometimes it will drop down to nine or eight and then it'll like pop back up again and it's like, ooh, it gets low. But, you know, it, it hasn't seemed to. And generally, you know, I mean, if you notice a change, then, then I would kind of be a little worried about it. But, yeah. I mean, if you've been driving it for a long time and then, you know, 45 to 55 when it's cold is, you know, depending on what kind of oil you're running in. I mean, it's, all right. Uh, and, and if I mess up your name, I call it Gerard, Her, Gerardo, Gerard, yeah. Gerardo. Yeah. Um, just starting, uh, just starting to get into car restoration. Need to buy my first welder. What should it be? Oh. Well, we could get into the Lincoln and Miller debate, and then you know we'll alienate half our market, or you know, forty percent <laughs> of our people viewing. Um, I, you know, my, you know, years ago we did a, we did a, an, a, an another thing. We did a, a, a shootout where we tested low-priced uh, entry-level wire feed welders, and you know we had one of everything there we had like you know the harbor freight ones we had you know and harbor freight of course has improved their qualities since 12 15 years ago but we had like one of everything we had like sears ones we had you know of course the the miller and miller and uh lincoln welders there and we had so we had a good assortment what we found was and we even had like some other you know, metal guys test them for, you know, a, a day. So we had like a lot of people test these different welders, had them all set up. What we found is that the, you get what you pay for in a welder. You, so if you, you spend the money and buy yourself, you know, like a, the Lincolns or the Millers and there's a few other, you know, like I think ESOB's making a wire feed now and some others. Um, if you spend the money on a good welder, you it's it's money well spent because you have fewer problems. We we've, we've had welders that you know barely got hot enough to melt the wire that was coming out of them, 
and the, and the whole time we were thinking this, and people are buying this and wondering why they can't weld working. with it. So think about you know think about it as an investment where it will pay you back for years to come. You know, I, I, you know, if you're just getting into restoration, uh, and I would get a welder that you know if you're going to do sheet metal and body stuff. You know, I'd get one that would drop down. I usually do body stuff at, with 023 wire. Uh, I know some guys that will use the 30, so, but you don't want to end up with like a, a 045 wire with that only takes flux core or something like that. You get get a wire that takes a bottle or gas. Get a welder that uses gas, and you get one that can you know if you're going to do body. It'll take a fine wire, yeah. and uh, if you're not going to do sheet metal stuff, then you know you're good with a three o or three five wire, and uh, that that's my recommendation. Thoughts? I think there's some really nice one ten welders out there, but I think like what you said, get get gas, don't get the flux core. Right. That's get get a gas one. It's a world of difference. But there, there's some really nice 110 welders out there that you can keep in your garage shop. Yep. Work yeah, that, that technology has changed so yeah. much. I know, you know, and I can't even make a solid recommendation, which, you know, it, and uh, granted, you know, technology change and people, you know, manufacturers start, you know, they, they hear if their welders aren't working right and they'll respond to that. So can I say that the welder that welded like crap for us, you know, 15 years ago or 12 years ago was, is junk? No, because, you know, it could very well changed. be a great welder now for all mm -hmm. I know. Uh, and, and so much of that stuff has changed, even uh, on like the TIG welders, you know, there was a time when, you know, that was the holy grail to have, you know, back then nobody called it TIG, they called it like Healy arc welding. And, uh, so it was like, oh, that guy's got a heliarch welder. And it was like, ooh, that was the, you know, that was like, you were like elite if you had one of those. Now they've become almost commonplace in most shops because they're affordable. Guys, you can, without a huge investment, you can buy that kind of stuff. So I don't suggest starting, if you're not familiar with welding, start with a, start with a wire feed. Uh, it's the easiest one to learn. Uh, and you know get really good at that and you know once you're good at that you can start exploring other kinds of welders but uh yeah my recommendation is by a name brand yeah name brand yeah. wow guys you're slow and don't come on get through them all <laughs> yeah yeah we've still got like a few minutes left um now to make sure that i didn't uh okay uh, are you able to recommend somebody in my, that can finish my 66 Chevelle interior That's a tough one. in the Albany, New York area? This is like the kind of questions I get all the time. And I keep saying, you know, if I was an expert on every, you know, the, and I don't, I don't really, you know, yeah, for me to, us to have any kind of idea, you know, we may know who's a good interior person here in town, but that doesn't mean we know who's a good interior person all over the place. And shop, good shops can go bad, and bad shops can get good. You know, they, each shop can have their own problems. Sometimes they run into cash flow issues, or maybe things, you know, maybe they worked out their cash flow issues. Now they got like everything's good. So, or maybe they had, you know, one guy that was really good at headliners, but he quit and went to another shop. Now, you know, you don't know this kind of stuff going in. Best solution I have is ask around. Talk yeah. to talk to people in your area that have cars like yours. Find out, find people that have had interior work done. Great thing about a, you know, a 66 Chevelle is you, they make kits for most of it. You can guys with even just a little bit of knowledge and patience and practice and uh, you can can do a lot of the interior themselves you know the the carpeting we've got a few videos on that the door card you know they they make them all done and ready all you gotta do is snap them on we've got videos on that 
What? Other than the headliners. Headliner can be headliner can be challenging, and uh, that's one thing I don't. You know, just take your time. Yeah, I, some guy. You know, if if you're if you got a knack for it, it it's it's a breeze. But uh, not everybody has a knack for it. You know, it's like you know, it's I don't know. All of it's available though. You can, like you said, you can buy it all yep. from yep. multiple companies for that car. You can oh, get yeah. it all, and it's really not that. Get yeah. a pair of hog ring, hog ring pliers and redo your seats yourself. Yeah. You can get the padding, the foam, all that. I'd, I'd ask around yeah. your clubs or forums around where you're at. Yeah, or you just go to a local car show, see anybody yeah. with yeah. with 66 Chevelle or 67 or even, you know, any, doesn't even have to be a Chevelle. It could be, you know, it could be a Mopar yeah. or Ford or whatever. You know, if it's got a new poultry or talk to the owners, you, you know, the one thing is you go to a car show, you go to like cruise night or roll in or something, car guys want to talk about their cars, you know, it's like, you know, I've, I've never seen a car guy that didn't want to talk about his car, you know, well, why would he be there if he didn't? Yeah. And they're happy to share you with, you know, their recommendations and their, you know, their horror stories. So. Uh, that's the best way to find out who in your area can do a good job. Exactly. Easy and choice. we've all heard the horror stories on some of that stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's not fun. It's not fun to have, you know, entrust your car to somebody and end up getting, right. you know, being disappointed in it. Cause you know, that's, that's my number one pet peeve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you know, uh, yeah. Oh, Alan's trading in. Uh, to Gerard, and uh, yeah, I'll mess up his one. He says thank you. Um, Alan writes, "I've got a 350 small buck Chevy in a 31 Ford Model A. Uh, every time it sits for a while, it has a bad backfire that eventually works itself out. I'm assuming as he starts to drive it, it backfire." Timing is spot on. How do I troubleshoot? So it works itself out when he drives it. Um, the uh, it almost sounds like something's freeing up then as he goes. Uh, what would free up? Advance on his distributor. Weight sticking. Weights, yeah, the, My, the, the mechanical advance or the vacuum. It's yeah. the the advance on on the distributor itself. It would probably crank pretty hard, wouldn't it? The what? It would probably crank pretty hard, wouldn't it? With that much advance. Uh, and then, unless it's sticking closed, oh. and then it's not advancing at all as he oh, starts right. to accelerate. And all of a sudden, you're putting all that fuel in there. Um, with an auto advance. I would, that's my first, you know, that's my first thought. And then as he drives it, maybe it frees up from getting used to being, and that's why it eventually it works itself out. So the, I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's probably running a standard distributor with a vacuum advance. So, you know, maybe the vacuum advance system, or maybe there's an issue with the vacuum line going to the, do the advance on the distributor or uh, or the I, the. Uh, I wonder how many miles. In yeah. a sticky valve too, for some reason. Well, how many miles before you? Uh, yeah, in, like it, 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 if you want to check a valve, then there's a. You know, it'd be good to run a vacuum check on yeah. the motor while it's running, and if you, there's a, if you search the site, I've got a chart out there that will explain different readings on your vacuum gauge and, and, and what it'll give you some feedback as far as um, if it's a sticky valve or if it's a, a timing issue or, you know, you can uh, vacuum gauge is a great way to f learn about a lot about how your motor is functioning. And if it's a relatively stock build, you know, or, you know, not too wild of a 350, then, then you're going to get a lot of good information from a vacuum gauge. And like I said, we got to, you know, if you just search on the site, there's a whole chart that explains all the different readings and, and give you some feedback as far as 
what those things mean. Um, but yeah, that'd be like a couple of places I'd start. You know, I remember a, a guy that I used to build, uh, used to paint race cars for his, that's whenever he had engine issues, that was the first thing he grabbed. It wasn't like any other tool. It was always the vacuum gauge, you know, but he lived and died by the vacuum gauge. You know, he, he was convinced that would give you more information on how your engine's running than that's anything cool. else. All right, guys, it's, I see now we're at 12 minutes after, and we did get started 10 minutes late, so my apologies again uh, for our late start. You know, I wish I could, uh, wish I could figure out when we're going to have technical difficulties getting everything set up here in the shop, but uh, I appreciate you hanging in there and coming out tonight. Um, Thanks again for all the great questions. We really appreciate that. Also down below the chat roll here, one last time, I'll give you a plug for that 66 tip uh, uh, download that I have uh, available down there. Go ahead and download that, it's free. Uh, and with that, you know, uh, we're left uh, wondering when we're going to the next car show Saturday. and if it's gonna rain. We won't be able to go to the next car show. <laughs> I never know. <laughs> you never know. All right, guys. Thanks, Thanks for coming up. We'll see you again next month.